Hello, welcome to the Charity Impact Podcast, where our purpose is to learn more about how effective charities and individuals achieve social change or social impact. I'm your host, Alex Blake, and I'm joined today by Mark Lever, OBE, who is the Chief Executive at Helpforce. And I'm just going to read out Mark's biog from their website and just give a little bit of introduction to you. The website tells us that Mark is a chartered accountant with a Cranfield MBA. The first 13 years of his career were spent training and practicing as a chartered accountant. He then decided to leave the world of finance and move into the third sector, a decision he's not regretted for a single minute of his 25 plus years in the sector. During this time, he's been chief executive of the WRVS, now the Royal Voluntary Service, and the National Autistic Society. He joined Helpforce in 2019 and has been leading the charity in its mission to accelerate the growth and impact of volunteering in health and care. And it doesn't mention everything that you've done but i know you've you've also held numerous trustee positions you'll be bringing that experience as well and of course it's it's since you've been at helpful that you were awarded the obe for services to volunteering during the pandemic so welcome to the podcast mark how are you today i'm very good thank you alex and delighted to be talking to you excellent just for context for the listeners mark you and i know each other of course from from our time both working at the national autistic society the nas and more recently working together at helpful so uh, we've spoken a fair bit over the years but it's it's usually only a few minutes of chit chat and then kind of to the task at hand so i'm looking forward to having a bit more time to ask you some questions and um, have a bit of a wider conversation yeah it's great i'm, I'm, re- I'm really looking forward to it, alex it's because um, obviously we've known each other for quite a long time but as you say it's always been very very work focused so it's quite nice to have a broader a broader conversation actually oh yeah put the sector to rights yeah, so let's start with one or two uh, fairly quick, easy questions to get us warmed up anyway. Um, so what, what charity did you give your most recent donation to and why? It's, it's a very sad one, actually. Um, a very good friend of mine who, um, a very keen cyclist, very fit guy, um, died earlier this year with uh, blood cancer. He was only 52, yeah. um, but received absolutely fabulous support from our local hospital so my last donation was to brighter futures which is the um the hospital charity down at the great western hospital here in swindon oh, okay I, I did not see that um they're being quite that good that type of response so i'm sorry to hear that about your friend um, it's a... yeah no it's um it and it's um i mean interestingly it's made us all i mean he's only um 51 um, so it's made us all take stock of um, our time on this planet and uh, everyone who knew him I, I think we've all thought differently about the way we live our lives and uh, you know live for the day has never been a, a more relevant motto I think. Uh, yeah I think particularly when when someone's younger it really does make you reflect on on how you spend your time and thinking about your own health and that type of thing mm. doesn't it and, and certainly the pandemic's done a lot of that for a lot of people as well I think hasn't it? Sure. Um, Okay, so can you tell us um, just very briefly what Helpforce does? So maybe just the kind of 60 second version or so for context. And I'd love to hear an example, um, something that just gives us a flavour of why the work that you do there is so important. Yeah, I, I mean, Helpforce, I mean, we're a quite small charity. There's only 16 of us and we were founded six years ago by Sir Tom Hughes Hallett, who, who felt that volunteers could make a much greater impact in the health and care space and, and support the health and care services. Um, volunteers in intelligently designed roles. So Helpforce was set up to work alongside health and care organisations who either involve volunteers or want to involve volunteers, but want to involve them in a way that makes greater impact. So we work alongside many NHS trusts, many local care organisations to help them grow and accelerate the impact of their volunteering. So um, sort of thing we might do, I mean, down in Kingston, um, we're working alongside the volunteering team there to develop um, a volunteering role and a team of volunteers to support people at home with their mobility um, by supporting them with their sort of physio exercises to either help them recover um, from having been in hospital and, and regain the mobility or to help them be fitter before they go into hospital to improve the um, outcomes from surgery. So that's just what, one example. What we, what we tend to do is um, to make sure that we package up the intervention so it can be scaled and spread elsewhere. But also evaluation is a really important part of the work we do, sort of measuring the impact of volunteering so that we can make a more credible business case for investment in those services in the in the longer term. So 
our evaluation goes beyond numbers of volunteers, numbers of hours, you know, multiplied by the living wage to say, look, this is the cost of volunteers to actually what's the, you know, how can we quantify the impact on the, the health of people, patients? How can we quantify the impact on health and well-being of staff? And how can we quantify the impact on the efficiency of the, of the system as well? Thank you. One of the ideas behind doing this concept is about speaking to people who are effective in, in their roles and have been successful in their sector and getting tips from them for people that are listening. So I was curious if there are any resources that you find useful in your work that you might recommend. So this might be books or mm. the kind of training programs, websites, newsletters, subscriptions, can be any any types of resources and, and could be kind of in or out of the sector, but things that you find useful in, in the work that you do or, or that you might recommend to people. Mm. I mean, as you know, Alex, you're talking to somebody with a lot of grey hair. I'm sort of six, 62 now, so I, I reflect back on when I first started in the, in the sector a long, long time ago. Um, I would accumulate sort of, and these were hard copies, sort of magazines and have them in a reading pile. And uh, mm. every six months I would find that I hadn't read them and they'd end up going in the bin. So I, I tended to, I, I, as you get a little bit old, you realise that you've got to be fairly selective. And so I um, I found out over the time, I, I've been lucky to um, get, go on some very impactful um, training courses. So, you know, I, I was lucky to be, funded through an MBA at Cranfield when I was at RVS um, and and that the learning from that has um, has helped me and stuck with me ever since you know the last 24 years since it, since I went there I was also lucky to attend a, a program at Harvard called strategic perspectives in nonprofit management and that that program brought together social enterprise leaders from across the globe. And again, the, the lessons and learning from that have stuck with me. But on a on a day-to-day -day regular basis, there are some some I, I like blogs that are thought provoking and just make me reflect. And I find there's a there's a chap called Steve Allman on LinkedIn who who writes a regular blog yeah. there. He he um, and I find his blogs really good. Joe Saxton, who many people will know. His, his blogs I always find very thought-provoking and the NFP research ones that um, obviously where he was before. And just to keep me in touch with what's keeping NHS leaders awake at night, I find the, I mean, the HSJ Health Service Journal, um, the online digest, which pops up once or twice a day, is just a really good way to take a very quick temperature of what's happening within the NHS in particular on a on a daily basis so we can just identify opportunities for responding or sort of generating some social media contact uh, content to um, align to some of those issues that, that are cropping up on a daily basis great thank you yeah it's funny the um the first point you made about having the magazine stacking up and not getting read i do the same thing now with email newsletters where there's a there's a few i subscribe to and they're good mm. but they'll they'll kind of sit there for a while and then in a couple of months time i'll clear out the uh the inbox where i have those sitting and by and large they they don't i'm sure there are some very organized people who are very good at that who are doing it but i've you know i i've i think i've realized over the years that it's um that, that there's probably a short you can short circuit that by not stacking them up in the first place uh, yeah definitely i think yeah it, it's useful to kind of stay in touch with what different people are thinking but it's it's just finding the time isn't it yeah i'm interested in how you think about how you structure your life how you manage your time so whether that's thinking about a daily routine or a format for your week or month um and i i really i like the detail of these things you know kind of what do you do between waking up and then starting work whether whether you're kind of working from home or or not what that looks like and then during the working hours well what are the working hours how do you kind of structure mm -hmm. that day um and then yeah you, know, you know when when do you finish and how do you switch off or or do you find that you're kind of always on and the, you know the email pings are coming through in the evening still and that kind of thing mm. I can, um, I, I, I suppose I could give you the really clever response to structure <laughs> for the day, or, or, or I could tell you what it's really, what it's really like. So yeah. I'll, I'll well, tell you what it's well, really Well, it's kind like. of interesting to hear both, I guess, if you've got, if you have a plan yeah. and then you have a reality as yeah. well, it'd be yeah, interesting. I, 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 I used to, um, I used to have some very detailed to-do lists and uh, plans for the day, but oh. found you, you, you never really stick to them. So the broad, broad, the broad principles, I mean, COVID and the, um, 
advent of far greater home working has had a had a really big impact on my life because i i've always ever since the early 80s when i was working in accounts and finance always had a very long commute sort of roughly about two and a half hours door to door each way so five hours a day commuting wow. Yeah. Um, which I used to convince myself was a very, um, very good thing because it meant I could clear through emails on the train and I could do all that reading I said I was going to do. But with hindsight now, I'm, I'm not quite sure that was right. So, so, so in the latter stages of my career, I've discovered that um, having having that five hours a day back can make a big difference. So I'm I prefer to start early than work late. I'm I'm much better early. So I I get up. Um, so I work from home predominantly now though um, obviously go on project visits and and go to London perhaps I mean maybe a couple of times a fortnight but I I get up quite early so I could be at my desk anything from half six till seven in the morning and I'll just go straight at you know looking at emails and um, anything I've got to write so you know if there are any board papers or, or blogs or anything like that I'll try and do that early in the morning I find I'm better at that and then the I make sure so I'd, I'll have a cup of tea and then first time I'll think about having breakfast or toast is <laughs> in that uh, golden period from half 10 till 11 in the morning when Popmaster's on radio too so I will uh, I'll I'll try and make sure that just going and having a slice of toast or something at half 10 so I can listen to that while that's going on because I, I like listening to that and then I'll work through I not don't usually stop for lunch I might grab something but I don't know what usually stop for lunch and I'll try by starting a bit earlier means I can finish around about you know the end of the day about five o'clock or sometimes a bit earlier and that will then give me a bit of space to go um, cycling so um, I think as you know cycling is one of my one of my passions and it just gives me a really good opportunity to go out and get fit and then um, and my wife and I both really like cinema. So uh, it also gives us a chance to go to an earlier an earlier show at the cinema as well. And and the other thing I find is that um, and again, I, I think it probably it, it sort of, I suppose, comes with experience. But I think w when I was in the earlier stages of my role, sort of perhaps in my 40s and 50s, I felt I had to be seen to be busy all of the time mm. um, and had to demonstrate to everybody how hard I was working but actually I think as you um as you get a bit older you realize thinking space is just as important as working space mm. and just having times to sort of reflect and think about things and and I find cycling is a good a good space to do that and I, I probably have some of my uh one of my, some of my slightly more creative ideas when I'm cycling and, and also mm. I find it's a good way to think through problems as well so I I find that 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 routine of getting up early i mean the basic principles are just get up early so i can finish a bit earlier to create space to do the stuff um that i would do outside work um and make sure that the toast coincides with pop master and the world's a good place <laughs> sounds good and is that that sort of structure is that um is that something that you've changed kind of during the pandemic or post pandemic or had you worked out some of that stuff already before that you see, I'm disappointed, Alex, because the question you really wanted to ask me was, "What's my average score on Popmaster?" But we'll we'll we'll, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll skirt over that. Um, I um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's changed beyond recognition um, since COVID because I was commuting virtually three or four times a week into London, as I say, mm. sort of early starts, late finishes, you know, late returns home. So yeah. my life has changed beyond all recognition in the last three years. And I feel more relaxed and um, I feel able to cope with the challenges of the, the, the throne of us better. And I find that I've got more more thinking time as well um, and, and and actually more time for the team as well. As I say, we, we've got a, a team that's about 18 of us at Helpful um, and, uh, you know, got more time to reach out to the team as well, which is good. Great. Um, and uh, in terms of that um, kind of switching off and, and sort of dealing with de-stressing and that kind of thing is is the bike the number one thing for you really definitely definitely yeah I, I, I mean I I always say um no matter what the weather actually I said and you're looking and you're thinking oh, I'm going to go out on the bike now and it might not be that lovely weather outside and you might not be feeling like it you never regret doing it but you always regret not doing it so once you're out there it's it just makes a big difference and I know, I know it's the same for a lot of people um and I really I really enjoy it and I and I I like I mean it's pretty tough we live in quite a hilly area so it's quite hard work but 
the way you feel when you come back is just you, you just feel completely refreshed when you come back okay and another question in terms of that kind of managing your time and planning your your day or your time when you do get overly busy if you i don't know if you sometimes feel i know i do if i feel like there's the to-do list is getting far longer rather than shorter if you get that feeling of kind of overwhelm or if you get a feeling where you're, you're lacking a bit of focus and you feel like you're just firefighting mm. and responding to stuff all the time have you got any any particular ways of managing that that dealing with that are the kind of questions you ask yourself or things that you do to to kind of get out of that and, and get back onto a more kind of productive footing i think i suppose it comes down to sort of what you what you prioritize and just i mean i remember i've probably been on lots of courses where they talk about prioritizing urgent you know urgent tasks the combination of urgency and importance but mm. i think instinctively you'd look at it and i mean if there's ever anything which is externally facing yeah which um you t typically for me is around relationships with funders and donors I, i'd sort of prioritize that if if any of the team are struggling or i've got a problem that's really important but when it comes down to it you usually find there's there's not loads of stuff that absolutely has to be done at all costs on that day. An hour's walk or a 15 minute walk around the block. You'd be amazed how different that list looks like when you come back to your desk. Mm. Just to switch off a bit, you, you can get lost in the in the detail, I think. Particular, I think particularly when you're homeworking because you're sat at your desk. I mean, everyone knows this, you know, you're sat at your desk all the time and oh, yeah. the opportunities that you have just to oh. think of it by in the, in the good old days when you used to walk between meetings or travel between meetings and have a bit of downtime to process the meeting you've just been to and then get ready for the one you're going to has gone for a lot of people. And, and I find you've got to try and build in those opportunities to sort of decompress and, you know, whether, as I say, whether that's a walk around the block or, mm going to make a cup of tea or you know as I say listening to pop master or whatever it may be uh, you know I think those things are important and usually when you've taken 15 minutes out you come back and look at what's what's in front of you it's never quite as daunting as you thought it was yeah and it's it's almost counterintuitive I suppose for for some people but having having that hour away from work rather than plowing yeah. through and doing another couple of hours into the evening can often be a more productive way of um as you say kind of reviewing you, you go back to that list and actually you realise there are probably a few things on there that if you don't do it, it doesn't really matter or, or you could easily delegate that or, you know, whatever it might be. And and what's important to us is that, I mean, we at Help Force, we really try to encourage a very flexible working environment and working arrange, arrangements for all of our team. And we, we don't really prescribe the hours that people should work. And we certainly don't expect people to reply to emails at crazy times or, or to send emails at crazy times. But if people choose to work odd hours, that's, yeah, that's entirely up to them. But the team know that they don't have to respond to them. But for, for me, the priorities are sort of relationships, you know, the, or support for the staff. If, if, if there's a member of staff who's got a problem or, the, or they're struggling, or if we've got to um, give a donor something that they need or a report they want. I mean, they they tend to be the most important things that we'd respond to, or certainly I'd, I'd be keen to respond to. Sure. And for the next question, can I um, rewind to, well, however far as you'd like to go, really? Um, what I'd be interested in mm. for um, kind of background for context is what, what was it that drove you initially to dedicate your career to social impact? Or, or when was it you first started thinking about about that kind of social change or social impact agenda and you can start from where, wherever you like it might have been in childhood or leaving education or it may have been um, when you were moving from the finance world into the charity sector what, what what was it that first made you think about that and what was the motivation to to really kind of make that your your career it's interesting actually because when i look at the career moves i've had and and, and what i've done i'm sure you could present that as a really well structured thought out career path and, and journey which was preordained um you know in 1960 when i was born but actually it was just a series of chance encounters along the way um so i 
I, uh, as, you, as you said, I, I trained as a chartered accountant and I, and I became a partner in the, um, the London office of the firm I was working for when, when I was relatively young, I was um, 32. And in those days, in the, um, in the early 90s, the, being a partner in a firm of accountants was the pinnacle of the chartered accountants' uh, dreams, which to people who aren't involved in chartered accountancy pro probably sounds more exciting than it actually is. And I say that with my tongue firmly in my cheek. Um, but as soon as I became a partner, I just had this overwhelming thought of, is that it then? Is, is, this, the next, is this the next 30 years carved, carved out for me? And, and just by chance, I, I had a phone call from somebody probably a year later, invited me out for lunch. And, um, and he said, you know, what does the well, took me out for a very nice lunch. He used to be the national senior partner of the firm where I worked, but had I thought had retired, but actually he'd gone to be the first paid chief executive of what was then the Women's Royal Voluntary Service. Um, oh. And and he said to me, what does the WRVS mean to you? And I did remember the WRVS because I used to, oddly enough, I used to volunteer in their, in their shop in, um, in Shrewsbury. And... Or it might be, or actually, this terrible thing to say, it might be in the League of Friends shop, actually. But there's a WRVS and League of Friends in, in Shrewsbury. And they, at the time, the WRVS were in a position where they'd got three million pounds to invest in invest in training. And I'd been, I'd had a director of training role in my in my job at the accountancy firm. And he'd asked me if I'd been interested in coming and do some work with them to set up a national training program for what was then 140,000 volunteers. And we, and I, I wasn't, I took a lot of time to think about it because it was a, it was a big move. I, you know, I partner in front of accountants and then thinking about going to work for a charity to do something I'd really never experienced before. And I've got a young family with a mortgage and, you know, there are various, and you look at the financial trajectory in accountancy and perhaps you, you recognize that the rewards are probably slightly different when you move into the charity sector which has never really been a, an overwhelming motivator. But when you have got a young young family and a mortgage, it, you take those things into account. But the more I thought about it, the more excited I got about the opportunity. And I thought I would go and do that for a year or two and then and then come back into the finance world. So I, I took the bungee jump and, and joined the RVS as director of training. And that opened up a whole world for me that I'd just never seen before. The world the world of volunteering the impact of volunteering and like within sort of weeks of visiting projects i just thought this is just incredible and i and i then i knew i was never going to look back i didn't quite know where my career was going to go but i knew i wasn't going to look back and we i looked at the three million pounds that we'd, we'd got from the from the trust um i'd looked at the cost of cost of training for 140,000 volunteers and I thought this money this money could get gobbled up really quickly so we thought why don't we invest in a residential training center generate an income stream so that we can create a sustainable income stream to fund fund the training of volunteers in the longer term so it was an early example I suppose of social enterprise and that's what we did and with the director of property chief exec myself um, we spent the next 18 months two years establishing a residential training center which generated quite a significant income stream which funded funded the training of all the volunteers and also grew grew an asset which ultimately actually when i when i left um, grew significantly from three million pounds which we acquired it for and um, when i left we sold it for nearly 15 million so it created quite a nice legacy for the um, for the charity as well so that's that's what got me into the got me into the sector, and I, I was at RVS for thirteen years. The last six of which I was there, I was their chief executive. And I think after thirteen, after that length of time, anyway, you see a number of challenges coming around, and you, you feel that actually it's time for somebody else to lead the organisation, and they've probably had enough of me. I've probably had enough of them, you know. And it was very amicable, and and I, I said, look, I I think I'm ready for another another challenge. I didn't know what that was going to be, and we agreed a period. I, I stayed on for a period of nine months to you know, help manage a transition without really knowing what I was going to do. And and then I had a call from Ed Hunter saying, what, what do you know about autism? And I said nothing at all. And he said. Um, 
He said, what do you know about the National Autistic Society? Nothing at all. He said, I'll send you something to read. And, and I read a report that had been written by New Philanthropy Capital, actually, about the state of the autism sector. And I was absolutely fascinated in that report because it was a world that I'd never really looked at. But what struck me about the, you know, the world of autism and the challenges that parents and families face was just the lack of fairness in the system. And, and I subsequently realized that one of my key drivers is is fairness and and and, mm. and that's always seemed to come through in a lot of things I do and I got more and more interested the the thing which fa I found most interesting was that although National Autistic Society was the largest single charity in the sector um it wasn't getting many recommendations from NPC to for donors to to fund it and I was I was curious about that and so I I threw my hat in the ring went through the selection process and uh, and got the job and I was very glad I did and I spent 12 really really interesting happy challenging years at, at National Autistic Society before I then moved on to uh, before I then moved on to Helpful so I and then Helpful Helpful's came about because I was so Mark Mark I'm just yeah. going to jump in there for a yeah. moment because I, I do want to ask you about about your time yeah. at the NAS and, and and then Helpful's as well but I, I just wanted to come back to that piece around training yeah. and, and I've I've got a question that has just come to me around that, which you may or may not have a view on. I mean, a number of times when I'm working with charities, particularly working with smaller charities who are developing new strategic plan or looking yeah. at fundraising strategy, and, and they're often looking at how can they grow income and how can they diversify income. And often, I mean, a lot of charities have great expertise mm. in the particular issue that, that they deal with. And there, there may well be a way to commercialise that expertise. And so quite often charities will, will kind of start to think about the idea of could we have a training offer or a training and consultancy type offer where we could we could sell our expertise in some format to whether it's kind of public sector organisations or private sector or, or other charities. And there are certainly examples of that being really successful. But I think there were there were an awful lot of examples where people kind of dip their toes into it a little bit and, and don't really get the success they're looking for. And, and then I think sometimes some of it's a bit of kind of giving up too early and not really doing it properly. But I just wondered if you if you had any view on that, given the amount of experience you have in, in that kind of area around. Do you think that is something that, that charities in general could and should be exploring and do you have any particular thoughts on you know why why it would or wouldn't work i i i think it is very difficult to make a significant income stream from from training for most charities there are some notable exceptions in that and without knowing the detailed financial of finances of this there are some notable exceptions you know where you have those high volume sort of training programs the likes of St John around first aid, British Red Cross, the first aid track, you know. So, so where you have those very high profile, great brands, great training programs nationally recognised, I, I think you, I mean, as I say, I, I don't obviously don't know the detailed finances of that, but I think you can make money from training. But the idea that you have a lot of training departments within charities saying, oh, we could, we could sell our training and make some money. I've never seen a significant income stream come from those activities. I mean, well, a, a significant income stream that makes a significant margin come from those things. The, the way that we at RVS made, made our money was we invested in a training centre and then got a, a, a skilled conference management company to come in and run that centre. And we got a share of the income that they generated from that. So actually, we made an investment in the centre to generate a return which we then invested in training and that's you know so we what we brought to the party we were lucky enough to have this significant donation at the time of three million pounds we brought the capital right. and we basically got a far better return on that capital than we would have done if we've invested it but we ch we looked really carefully at the partner that we chose and we looked really carefully and worked hard to structure a deal where both sides would benefit from the growth in that in that business and and the money that we generated from that and we invested in our own training but people who think we're going to sell training courses I, i'm quite happy to be proved wrong but as i say there are some notable exceptions where you have some of those large-scale nationally recognized programs the likes of which british red cross and st john run 
but beyond that the idea that you can run training courses and make money i i think is um is for the birds really that's interesting um i I, and i i I don't think that's the reason why you shouldn't do it because i think there's a lot of mission-led training you know so when you're trying to spread the word and build capacity that's part of your mission i think that's fine but i'm not sure there are that many charities who have that as a significant source of unrestricted income for their um for their activities yeah great um okay sorry i interrupted you as you were uh, getting to the nas and i think the i mean the the thing that i'd be interested to hear would be thinking about those three chief exec roles at the wrvs and then the nas <laughs> we do love an ac- acronym in the sector don't we <laughs> yeah, i yeah, think yeah. probably in all sectors yeah. really um and then at Help Force and quite different organisations. So um, yeah. can you comment on the, the difference between those three chief exec jobs? This, I, I mean, I mean, scale is an obvious one. I, I mean, Royal Voluntary Service and National Autistic Society it, it actually employed a very similar number of people. We had about three and a half thousand people at, at, at both organisations. Help Force, we got 18. So, so sc- scale, is, um, scale is one obvious difference. I think personally... RVS was my first chief exec job, so I made loads of mistakes. And then you get excited when you go into your second chief exec job and you think, oh, I can learn from all those mistakes and and put all that good learning into practice at NAS. And then you realise you make loads of mistakes there as well. So I think there's something about about the scale between between the roles and the nature of the work that the organisation did. RVS was obviously very focused on community-based sort of volunteering activity. NAS had a much much stronger well-established policy and campaigning function which was a very big part of the the work and, and impact that NAS made and then help force as a as a relatively new charity that was going through the sort of early stages of their maturity cycle with the founder and chair's vision and um, very clear about how can we help organizations accelerate and grow the impact of their their volunteering so very different organizations very very different histories i think in, you know, when i reflect on the the differences from a from a practical point of view when you're in organizations like the royal voluntary service or national autistic society there is a scale and a profile there that is helpful because people know who you are know what you do or, or they think they know what you do and that you know that will open doors to potential donors it will help you with recruitment it will enable you to provide career paths and career opportunities for for the staff in those organizations but then at helpful so what i found really interesting is i would probably the experience i've had at helpful over the last three years would probably make me a very different ceo of a large national organization if i was ever to go back to one which i think at my age now i don't think i will but i i think that when you've got a much smaller organization there are lots of advantages that you can get everybody together in one room and be really clear about the the vision mission of the organization and that's important because if in an organization of three and a half thousand people you have some people who aren't aren't necessarily aligned to what you're doing or aren't aren't necessarily doing things that they when i say they should be doing that are are contributing to the overall mission then it doesn't make that big an you know doesn't make that big an impact but if in a team of 18, one or two of them aren't really clear about what they should be doing and are doing something which isn't really pushing us towards that vision, it really has a big impact. That's two out of 18, one out of 18. It's So the importance of making sure that everyone's aligned and clear about what we're trying to achieve is so important in a smaller organisation. Now, I know that when I was at rvs and nas i thought it was really important there as well because you've got to make sure everyone understands where we're going and what we're doing but what tends to happen in the larger organizations is it's much easier to get mission creep because you've got people all over the country doing their thing and they might you know they might move into one area that you you might not even be aware that they've moved into a particular area or they're delivering a particular service in the smaller organizations you've got to be much clearer about what you say no to because it can just drag you off your axis yeah. so easily so the thing for me i found with help force is that is the importance of being really clear about what we're trying to achieve and really clear about what we say no to and what we say yes to and i think that's the that's the biggest difference for me strategically is that in the larger organizations you've got the scope 
I mean, mission creep, everyone will tell you, is not a good thing, but it you can almost you can get away with it a bit in larger organizations, but in smaller organizations, you just you just can't. And the other thing which has struck me is that when you're chief exec for larger organizations and you have your board of trustees and um, with the greatest will in the world you you know you want to work closely with your board of trustees but the in the larger organizations the board of trustees are probably slightly more remote from the executive team and there may be times when that works well for the exec team and they're quite happy for that and they might even actively try to keep them keep them at arm's length and just feel that they should be you know left alone to get on with what they're doing but when you're a small organization the board the number of people on the board can be almost be as many as the total number of people who are working in the charity and the, the board is see i i find i see our board as more of a resource for the charity while still sort of respecting and understanding the boundaries between governance and executive responsibility but actually, I find that I use the board much more and involve the board much more in things we're doing as a resource, because effectively they can almost double the size of the team that we've got. And we're blessed with some really brilliant people on the board at Help Force and bringing those in. So I, whereas in the larger charities, and this is probably an inappropriate thing to say, I probably spent some time holding the board at arm's length. Smaller organisation like Help Force, I probably spend more time trying to bring the board in um, to help us with what we do as well. There was something you said there that I just wanted to come back to briefly, where you said if you were to go back to Matt, to being a chief exec at a large organisation like the NAS, having had the experience at Help Force, you would probably do do things differently or be a different type of chief exec. What 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 did you mean by that? What were what did you have in mind with a kind of one or two? I think I'd probably I'd, I'd probably reduce the number of activities, um, and I'm not. I'm not think about NES but I think larger organizations probably ensure that we had a much clearer much clearer focus a lot of inefficiency arises from those layers of of communication and the stuff gets lost in translation mm. and you end up doing things perhaps less efficiently and you you spread you spread into areas where you think you're not necessarily in, in the best place to do that so so I would I would probably have a much more focused mission I would be I would certainly say no to more things. And I, and I think most, I mean, most boards encourage chief execs to think twice before they agree to do something. But I, I would certainly say no to more things and have a much more focused approach to the work that whatever organisation it was we did, because that enables you to get, give a much clearer message and direction to everyone working in the organisation. And, and where I see what I see in the small charity I'm involved in now, the much greater clarity that we have, that you can communicate across the team and bring that focus to the team, the much greater impact you can make, I think. Now, I'm not knocking charities who diversify and have all sorts of divisions, but I think if you take each division in turn, it's that clarity of focus and ensuring that all of the team are aligned with that clarity, which is the really key thing, I think, which, you know, which makes a difference. And what I see you know in my own organization now and this may come back to the NAS again uh, what I'd really like to dive into now is a particular achievement if you pick out one of the kind of big achievements that you're proud of and if we can think about how that came about how how intentional was that was it something that first came about by chance was there a clear strategy and plan mm -hmm. and maybe what what were some of the kind of tactics and things that really made it work because that's that's a big part of the work that I do now is thinking about how can charities be successful and achieve their objectives and be effective and mm. and how can you develop the right strategy the right plan and then implement that effectively and so what 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 comes to mind for you um as a, a really big win i think I, I think the first thing i would say is that i and and i and, and i i mean this i i think i've i've never really felt as if i've achieved anything myself i've always been really lucky that the organizations that I've worked for have had really talented, passionate and committed people who've achieved great things. And, and really I've just removed any barriers that there may have been to them doing what they want to do. So w when I talk about any achievements, it's really with great credit to the teams that I've been lucky to work with. But I think the NAS, when I think about the NAS one, probably the most significant achievement there was uh, managing to get the first ever 
disability specific piece of legislation on the statute book, uh, statute books the first piece of primary legislation which was the autism act which started as an autism as an autism bill and this the story of the autism bill was we had a very talented team a uh, policy public affairs team at nas led led by some really great people who, who've gone on to lead other great organizations the the alumni from that that particular team are, are doing great things across across the sector but the the challenge for for us was that if we were really going to try and create change for autistic people and their families we needed to make sure that there was a sort of a, a legislative underpinning and there was a much greater political awareness of the challenges that autistic people autistic people faced. And, and, and we felt that if we could get a bigger conversation and a more public conversation at a political level about autism, then that would start to create greater change. So we thought producing a an autism bill and it, encouraging th through the private members bill system um, encouraging a an MP to take it forward as a private members bill the associated debate and discussion around that bill would do just that it would raise the profile of autism in 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 parliament and, and across the wider the wider public I think when we started we never thought that we would manage to get a private members bill actually becoming an act and be put on the statute books because not many not many do so the team put together a really clear plan of trying to get that the first stage was to get the bill adopted by a private member to take it forward and it, it was years in the making the lobbying of mps cross party about autism was was essential and, and this had gone on you know whether it's through the party conferences whether it's through constituency support whatever it was was just making the case around autism why autism was so important that they you know they took autism seriously in their constituencies and at the national level so that when the uh, the ballot was drawn for people who were going to be able to take a private members bill forward we wanted to make sure that in that top 10 the first 10 mps out of the hat that we would have someone who was a supporter of, of the nas and when the ballot was drawn we had you know, three or four people in the top 10 that we were, that we knew were um, good friends of the NAS and thought we'd have a good chance to take it forward. But the bit of luck that we had, and there's always a bit of luck in these things, is that the person who came out first was somebody that I used to work with in my um, accountancy days, Cheryl Gillen. And Cheryl and I had worked together in the 80s. And so this gave us a, a route in to talk to Cheryl and, and not not that the friendship was the reason why she adopted it, but it just gave us the opportunity to make the case for her taking that forward. And she decided to, she decided to take the draft bill forward as a private member's bill. And then ensued a whole series of debates, discussions with then the Labour government and the, and Cheryl was obviously a Tory, not obviously she was a, a, a Tory MP. So we had a whole series of debates and discussions as the bill, as the private member's bill made its way through the, the legislative process. And, as it gains so so mark i'll just jump in again i've got a couple of questions which yeah, will, that will probably become less relevant if you if you go on so uh, two things i just wanted to rewind a little bit to thinking about the kind of the idea to first of all develop that bill was that done as part of a kind of strategic planning process and there was within the strategy there was an objective we will aim to achieve this and and it, it was kind of structured in that way or was it more of a there was an idea internally and you tried to see if there was some traction and then once you got it then it became a bigger part of the kind of grand plan and then the the second thing that occurred to me which i'll it's a completely separate question but i'll just chuck it in now so you can get back into your flow um, was just to ask about the kind of the media side of things so the mm -hmm. you mentioned there was a lot of work lobbying mps individually and i remember around that time there was there was a lot of media attention around autism and there was just a, a greater awareness of the condition building generally in society over a good number of years and i, I can't quite remember if that was something that kind of happened before getting the bill and the act or if it was deliberately part of your campaign then or if it kind of what the quite the timing was so that First of all, that question about was it part of the strategy or did, was it more organic and then where the media piece sat in? It, it was part of the strategy. I mean, the team had a very, a very clear series of plans for 
raising the profile of autism in in parliament and had worked hard on this o over the years and that goes back to sort of lobby as i say lobbying mps at both the constituency level and and you know during party conferences so i can remember the team working really hard and all of us having those little half hour sessions with local mps at all the party conferences just sowing the seeds of autism making them aware of the challenges getting them on board and every year going back to the same ones and keep driving it home so there was a concerted effort to push it up the political agenda to get more political support because whilst you can make short-term change by doing something at a local level the long-term change has to come in most cases will come through statute or legislative change you know to make things happen to have that legislative underpinning is, is so so important so there was a the, you know the team had put together a very clear strategy to to do this and and really worked hard to to implement that of course the the public awareness and the growth of the public awareness is really important because as we discovered all MPs rely on people to vote vote them in and, and they respond to those things and, and I found that the perhaps the most powerful part of the campaign actually was mobilizing constituents to write letters to their to their local MPs about the impact autism was having or, or the lack of services or, or the impact of the lack of support on their families and these weren't sort of computer generated pro forma letters that were delivered so you know there's ten thousand letters and they all look the same apart from the top yeah. and tailing these were and I, and I can remember the minister at the time commenting on these were handwritten pages and pages of personal testimony from local constituents that really made the difference and as part of the a key part of the process is of, of seeing the private members bill go through um, parliament is to get on the friday when it's debated is to get i think it's a hundred i think it might be a hundred mps in the house I, I can't remember the number now but i think you had to get a hundred mps in the house on the on the friday which is quite difficult because most of them go back to the constituencies yeah. and i can remember us all just waiting to see how many mps we got there and we mobilized all of our links through our membership and um, got constituents to write the letters to get their MPs into that debate. And we managed to achieve that. And as the minister at the time said, he said it was, this was all down to personal testimony, human stories, people telling their stories. And that's what really, that's when we realized that we had a chance of actually getting the bill to become an act of parliament. When we saw the response from cross party response from MPs to that personal testimony. And we worked hard to encourage um, constituents to constituents to write to their local MPs to do that, and and they responded. And what what was the timescale from from the point at which you could say was the the kind of starting point of doing that work and and deciding that you you were going to try and get that bill through to then passing the act? And I know there were there was more work to do after that in terms of the implementation of the act, but I mean that that presumably was a number of years in itself just to reach the point where the act is is put into statute books yeah there are probably people far better qualified than me to answer that but i would say just from memory it's probably three years from that initial lobbying getting people on board then trying to get the well, in this case cheryl to take the members bill forward and then to get to get it through the house you know so but i think that the sort of beginning middle and end there's probably a good three years um, to do that it was a, it was a lot of work a lot of work in you know preparation which was sort of hidden from view really I think and and it was I think one of the tricks was the simplicity of what we wanted in the act um, and in the in, in the bill we we got some great support from legal teams to help us try, so we made it as easy as possible so we'd actually drafted the bill and said we, we we produced a draft of what we wanted the bill to look like so we made it as easy as possible for MPs to see what it was so it wasn't a nebulous thing it was really clear and essentially what the bill did was it placed a statutory duty on the government to produce an autism strategy, which had to be reviewed every five years. That's all it was. We just wanted them to produce a strategy that was reviewed every five years. And the, and the, having it reviewed every five years was really important because it would to just to produce an autism strategy, which then faded away, would be one thing. But actually making sure that it was reviewed on a regular basis, made sure that it would step, you know, we could keep holding the government to account on that as we went forward. So it was quite, it, it was a very short, but very straightforward piece of legislation. Yeah, I think there's something there that, around 
making it easier for people to say yes to to the thing that you're trying to get through you know actually drafting the bill for them is a, a much easier thing for to make it happen rather than saying this is what we want you go and do it um yeah. and it, yeah it, it's definitely testament to the strength of that policy and campaigns team at the nas because of course the throughout that will have been people doing that really detailed work you know really impressive stuff and actually for um anyone listening who are fans of policy and campaigns work we one of our other early guests is going to be amanda amanda batten who was the director of external affairs there who and we may well dig into more detail on, on this amanda was the driving yeah. force behind it amanda was the reason and um, i mean she led the team as i say I, I was just very lucky to work with some really brilliant people and amanda is certainly yeah. one of those Right. Well, thank you. That is that was certainly an impressive achievement there for the for the team and the organisation and, and and the people that it, it represented. I wonder if we can kind of flip to almost the kind of the opposite of that and ask you if you could reflect on a, a particularly bad experience, some sort of negative experience yeah. you've had in the sector and and how you've dealt with that. So it, it could be any number of things. Um, whether it's some some kind of failure or or some kind of crisis that you had to deal with, what what comes to mind with you in in that respect, and 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 how did you kind of manage that? Probably the, I, I mean the the toughest one, the toughest one without a doubt, which had an impact on many many people, was a service failure in in one of our in one of our homes where there were there was abuse of the people that we were supporting and. And and that was, I mean, ultimately you are responsible for making sure that everyone is safe and and supported and and well looked after, and you have a number of you know, loads of services across the country. And when a service fails to do that, it's devastating. It's devastating for the families. It's devastating for the people that you're you're there to support. And you you know, whilst you're in the you're very much responsible for what's happened in a in a legal sense a statutory sense as a person you you just feel desperately sorry for the people that's happened to and you feel as if you've let people people down and and, and i think when things like that happen you have to reflect and think about what do you what do you learn you, the sad thing is you can't do anything about you you can't change what's happened but you have to think about how you can learn, uh, learn and move on. And it had a really significant impact on me and the way I thought about how I'd led and managed organisations. And, and I think there is a danger when there's a lot going on that you slowly discover you're spending more time, more time in an office, in this case in, in London, more time in an office in meetings with reports about what's happening around the country and... Uh, monitoring reports and quality reports and events like this bring you up short certainly bring you up short and make you realize that you can read stuff on a bit of paper but you cannot replace or substitute getting out more getting out into the field and seeing what's going on and seeing for yourself what's happening because there is there's something about environments that can't be captured on paper there's something about services that can't be captured on paper and that's the we used to call it the smell of it the you know mm. the look the feel the smell of it does this feel does this mm. feel right it might look right on paper but does it feel right and you can't get that feeling without getting out more and go and see people and it made and i think for me it just made me realize that we'd actually ended up relying too much just on papers and reports mm. and not getting out more and doing visiting more services i mean we visited services and i think with hindsight now i would probably spend more time getting out visiting services just checking checking on things you know getting the look and you know, just the feel and the sense of things as um as you know when, when, you know when you go to visit and and i think that's that's a really hard lesson knowing that you've let people down and knowing that, that you you should have done more and, and you could have done more but you just got sucked into this world of just meetings central and it's no excuse at all it's just recognizing you made a mistake and and you need to get out more 
you need to get out more and and the bigger the organization the more dispersed the organization the tempted the temptation is think well it's a really big organization i need to sit in my big office and have these meetings and look at all these reports but actually it's just the opposite Mm. the bigger the organization the more you need to get out because it is so dispersed and you just get out there and you realize that's your number one priority and if you miss some meetings centrally so be it you know you should be out more um and and that was a big lesson for me um and a big learning for me actually going you know going forward and i I assume as well as that there will have been of course some kind of formal investigation and there will have been things put in place you know to improved kind of safeguarding and and reviews of kind of management and training and and all those sorts of things that will have done the best to to mitigate the risk of things like that happening again yeah so I'll, i'll I won't ask you to kind of dig into all of those details because we'll, we'll, we'll run out of time. But I, I'm curious, um, you know, for other people listening that might have some kind of experience like that, other chief execs maybe, how did you manage that? Uh, how What was the experience of that for you personally? So, I mean, it, it can you mentioned it there and can almost kind of hear it in your voice even reflecting on it that it's it's clearly a, a kind of an emotional yeah. thing to deal with and, and not a nice experience so i mean can you reflect back on that time how did you feel and how did you how did you manage to deal with that kind of emotion in the moment and how did you kind of move on from that because obviously it's there's the the crisis point and then there's getting past that and, and taking action, but also moving moving past that really kind of emotional time. Yeah, it's you, I'll, I'll never forget it for as long as I live because I I I've just felt that we really let people down. I mean that you know so you and you don't you, you know you don't forget it. But at the time there were other members of staff involved, and so I was very much focused on trying to make sure that they felt well supported. But these were one or two very, very bad apples working alongside some brilliant people. Mm-hmm. And a concern for me was the impact it was having on the morale motivation of those brilliant people who were being sort of, if you like, tarred with the same the same brush, really, um, and how we could support them and, and continue to support them. But at the same time, recognising at the heart of this were families and individuals who'd really been, you know, who'd really been let down. And I think, as I say, you can't, you can't go back and change anything. All you can do is to try and find the best way through it to ensure that the folk affected are now well, well supported and that you don't, you don't make the same mistake again. You learn from it as you go, as you go forward. People who run similar organisations, you know, these sadly these things happen but i think it's it's all the time about making sure that you learn from it and and no one else suffers in the same same way as you go forward and i I think that's that for me that was the the important thing so it was number one was support for the families affected who were very very angry with me with the organization but still trying to do the best we could to support them in some cases they might not have wanted that and then support for the staff who were in that in that same area who, who, who'd been affected the excellent staff who'd been affected and then for the organization to look at how does the organization learn from this and and not and not make the same mistakes again going forward or, or, or reduce the chances of making the same mistakes again going forward because it's always very difficult to say this will never happen again because yeah. you've got you've got people involved and you can put all the processes in the world but things do happen from time to time sadly but you just need to reduce the chances of that happening again yeah, of course. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I know it's not a not an easy one to think about and talk about. Let's bring ourselves right back to the present day. And with this one, I'm going to ask you what your biggest frustration is in the sector or in your work at the moment. So it could be could be a micro or macro thing, could be a little pet peeve, or it could be a more serious issue, whichever way you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't I, I used to get really frustrated but uh, I, I realize now that um, getting really frustrated doesn't really change very much. Uh, I, I, I suppose what do I think about the sector at the moment I, 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 I feel that the sector the, the sector you know charities particularly charities working with specific causes or specific challenges have tremendous knowledge of how support should be delivered and I just don't think they're consulted enough. Um, you know, in, in service design, either at, 
I think local government is, is getting much better at consulting voluntary and community sector in, in how services could be designed. But I think I get quite frustrated with the sort of national government, you know, always working on a flavour of the month and not thinking longer term and more strategically about some of the challenges that the country faces and and certainly not consulting organisations who are working at the grassroots who've got so much insight and understanding about issues. What If you take the Trussell Trust, for instance, what they don't know about food poverty probably isn't worth knowing. Now, I, I imagine the Trussell Trust, I, I've got no axe to grind for the Trussell Trust, but I've got a lot of respect for them as an organisation. But I just hope they are brought in and they're front and centre of thinking about strategies around food poverty. I think, you know, there are some fabulous small local charities supporting people with low level mental health issues, delivering great support and great services, running on fresh air or a shoestring at best. And I would much rather see funding going from statutory services to some of those local charities who are providing great support, who could do so much more to prevent people from going into acute services for instance so i think this this focus on the, or this lack of focus on prevention and the preventative role that a lot of these local charities have and the lack of funding for those charities is quite frustrating so i think really appreciating the impact and the understanding that local charities have on particular issues and conditions and the support that they can provide is, is really underestimated by uh, certainly national government and in some cases local government although i do think local government are getting better at consulting the voluntary community sector Great, thank you. In doing some research for this conversation, I stumbled across an interview you did back in 2015 when you were at the NAS and you were talking about the need for charities to be more business-like to survive um, and talking about that about generating income through trading and charitable activities, but also understanding about understanding your audience, relationship management, knowing where your strengths are, focusing on, on those things that you can be excellent at. And I I thought that was, that was really interesting, some really good points in there. And I just thought it'd be interesting to reflect now, kind of seven years on from there, following Brexit and the pandemic, and particularly the financial impact of the pandemic on the sector, I think changed some of the way that we think about the financial sustainability mm. of the sector, because actually it was it was the charities that have more reliance on trade and income as opposed to grant funding and so on that, that struggled more. Um, as a result of that. So I wonder yeah. what your thoughts now on what charities need to do to survive, perhaps not for helpful, so the NAS, but maybe thinking more about some of those kind of smaller local charities um, that are struggling with rising costs and flat or reduced income. What are your thoughts around that financial sustainability issue? I think, yeah, no, it's a really good question and, and it's a really good reflection because it, it, it wasn't lost on me that during COVID, as you say, that the, the charities with significant trading income were the ones who, who struggled. I, I think... I think we have to accept the funding of charities is fairly mixed economy. There will always be a mix of some traded income, um, grants, local, you know, local national government funding, donations, whole the, that that whole mix. And obviously, as with most things, if you've got if you've got a diversified income stream, then you're more likely to be be able to ride through any of the um, any of the challenges as they uh, as they come. But it's the sense of that you know that balance in that income stream. I suppose going back, you know, you say specifically about those smaller local charities. I think what we saw during COVID was the power of smaller local charities, the power of those sm smaller local charities to mobilise community support very, very quickly. And, and within days, the power of the local charities to understand the needs of people in their local communities, knew where they were, where they lived, what support they needed, and the power of local charities to mobilise relationships with local businesses as well and what I hope we don't lose although there's evidence suggests we you know we might be going back to how things were before is that sense of reliance that was placed on those charities at the time and the way that funding restrictions were rolled back or criteria for access to funding was rolled back so that we could mobilize those charities and support those charities I just hope that's not lost going forward because I think that if you step back and you look at that local support that was provided, the crisis we face now with very vulnerable people at home suffering from the cost of living, heating, people on waiting lists, people just coming out of hospital, people struggling to get appointments with their GPs, we are, we are possibly in a much greater crisis and we need that same sort of support going forward. And we need 
these charities that have been able to run incredibly efficient, efficiently, as I say, probably on fresh air in most cases, for a, for a relatively small amount of funding for those charities, they can continue to make a significant impact. And I think national and local government have got to think about, would our money be better invested in public services or would it be better to take some of that money out of public services and give it to the local charities to continue and grow what they're currently doing because they do it so well but let's not wrap loads of restrictions around it let's not make them bid every year to get that funding released let's give them long-term funding and let them decide how they spend it to best effect to support people rather than putting in tons of reporting requirements telling them how they should do it because it's that frustration with grants from you know government-based grants which actually makes people think about other sources of income because they think it's just less hassle they can get on and do things in the way they want to do them so for me i think it's about let's if these smaller local charities have got a proven track record funding but let's not wrap loads of restrictions around it let's make it longer term funding so they can get on and support people and actually ultimately prevent people from having to access some of the statutory services that are that are there in the first place absolutely and and actually then saving the public sector the public purse in the long term exactly yeah the, 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 there's a really clear business case for, you know for that yeah yeah there, there is and i mean in some in some sectors there's real evidence uh, of that you know there's the the kind of the cost benefit analysis have been done the social return on investment models and so on in others less so but anecdotally and through common sense you can kind of see if you prevent the need for those acute services but it's it's just that constant battle isn't it of making that case you need to spend now to save later exactly but the, the, it's the there's very much a, a short-termist way of thinking isn't there in in certainly for politicians who are on that kind of election um, cycle um, but also I, I think in in other parts of, of government and, and civil service and so on. I think it's how do you build that sort of crisis response into business as usual. Mm. Whenever there's a crisis, it's the voluntary sector that responds yeah. and, and, and makes the difference. There's a big flood or there's a fire or, you know, whatever. It's the voluntary sector who step up to the plate and it's a community response that steps up to the plate. And I, I think it's how do you build that into business as usual. And, and, and that does require funding, but actually it's it's really efficiently um spent because the charities have got a track record of doing things very very efficiently because they've had to yeah it is and it, it's frustrating that the the trust isn't there that it will be spent efficiently and effectively because i think that's often yeah that's the reluctance both from government and from private foundations around unrestricted funding isn't it and will it be used efficiently and effectively and by and large i think it it is yeah I agree. But we'll we will move on because we're 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 running towards the end of our time. You've been really generous with your time, so I don't want to to overrun. So we'll see if we can just squeeze in a couple of quick questions towards the end and give you an opportunity to say anything you might want to the listeners. So can I ask you what what advice you might give to someone who wants to be successful in this sector, whatever that means? So someone that's maybe at the either at the beginning of their career or, or maybe they're, they're somewhere around mid-level and are maybe looking to move into a chief executive or a more senior role for the first time, what what advice might you give? And, or, or is there any bad advice you hear being given that you think people need to avoid? <laughs> that's a good question, actually. I I think for me, the first thing is to really understand what makes you tick. Because I think working in charity and particularly with a, a senior role in a charity or a facing role in a charity, it's so important that you can convey the passion for the cause. I mean, I don't, I, I'm not sure it's it's easy to fake that. And, and so I think before you can do that, you really need to understand what makes you, what makes you tick. So you 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 look at charities that you might want to work with and and choose those that are or approach those that align with your your passion. I remember I remember talking a mentor of mine when I was chief executive of RBS for the first time, and he he was saying he said oh because I was asking him, he he'd had a number of quite senior trustee roles and he said oh I've done you know with national and international charities and I've done this and done that because I'm really passionate about this passionate about that. 
but he said, I could never do animals. I could never do animal charity. He said, he said I don't dislike animals, but I could never get passionate about animals. And it's always stuck in my mind. I think he said this to me back in the 90s. I mean, it's always stuck in my mind because I think it's so true. I think you can, charities are, yeah, obviously there are a lot of people in charities who are doing a job and they, you know, they'll move on and do something else. But I think if you, as you get more senior roles, unless you can be, unless you can talk with passion and, and you feel it, it's very difficult to to do what you need to do as a as a chief exec and and, and for me i think there are you know, as a chief exec communications are really important fundraising is really important understanding the finances is really important you know, the comms and the fundraising you've really got to be able to um communicate that passion so so i think it's it's really understanding what makes you tick so that your your values are aligned to the charity so it, it, it taps into you and, and and that passion grows as you as you become more exposed to the work the the other thing that's slightly slightly more practical advice for people who want to succeed in the sector i really encourage people to try and take more trustee roles i think you can learn a heck of a lot from being a trustee which is really helpful to being on the other side of the table in a in a senior exec role and, and make you appreciate what trustees you know the, the challenges that trustees have and, and it also gives you great exposure to the more strategic end of of, of charity work so i i also encourage people to you know to try and take on trustee roles because i think apart from anything else there's a desperate need for really great trustees of local and national charities and local charities you can really make a big difference with trustee roles yeah and um, address is a pet peeve of mine and i think there are far far too many charities that don't have anyone on their board that has worked in the charity sector yeah you've got the lawyer you've got the hr person you tick those couple of yeah. boxes and then you've got some well-meaning folks that believe in the cause and so on but um far too many cases where there's no one that actually knows what it's what it's like to work day day to day um, in a charity now i i find it I, and in fact i've a couple of the boards i've been on um, one i'm on at the moment i think the reason i was approached is because they wanted somebody with charity sector experience on that on that board right I'm going to ask one final question yeah. and it's going to be a silly one. So if you weren't being a chief exec of a charity, assuming income isn't a consideration, you could do anything you want. If you want to be a doctor, it doesn't matter that you don't have medical training, presumably. If you could just pick anything else that you might be doing, what what might that be? This can be anything. Yeah, anything you like. You see, again, this is one of those centre forward for Chelsea yeah, yeah, yeah well, of course. for a professional cyclist <laughs> this is one of those things where I could come up with smart oh, I, would, I would like to be a politician you know, yeah. you know, make, yeah. no. the, the honest answer is I would have loved to have been in a band <laughs> I would have loved to have been yeah. in a band <laughs> um, and, and I don't I don't have many regrets but one of them is that I never persisted with uh, learning a musical instrument um, but no I'd just love to have been in a band Simple as. <laughs> so, well, so, so you never know when I when I retire. When I retire, yeah. So so it's never too late. <laughs> I think I think our I think our mutual friend Al started a band not yeah. so long ago, um, in in his garage or something like that. <laughs> yeah, well, he's he's going through he's going through a midlife crisis, as we all know. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, my son, my son's in a, um, you know sort of a band as a as a hobby and uh, i'm living my dreams through that by carrying his stuff for him so it's uh, <laughs> so. yeah <laughs> well thank you mark uh, so i'm going to give you an opportunity now just to say anything that you might want to any folks that are listening hopefully we have a few people yeah i'm <laughs> tuning into this if you got anything that you would like to say to the audience anything any ask that you might make of them or suggestion yeah I, I mean firstly thank you for putting up with my ramblings for however long this has been but secondly yeah helpful so we, we are we, we've launched a, a back to health campaign where we're trying to encourage health and care organizations to partner with us to look at ways in which they can grow their volunteering to help the nation get back to health to help them grow volunteering interventions to support people in their homes in hospital while they're waiting to go into hospital so if you're interested, you know, if you're a voluntary organisation, you you want to be part of that campaign, then if you just go to helpforce.community, the website, you'll find more out about it. And we'd love to we'd love to talk to you. Great. And that back to health is about people getting back to health after the pandemic, isn't it? It's it's after the pandemic. Yeah. So, so it's really supporting people to get back to health 
after the impact of the pandemic, which could be extended waiting lists, it could be people who've been quite isolated, people whose mental health has been impacted, you know, people who are struggling to recover at home. So, you know, really covers the millions of people who are struggling at the moment. Great. And we'll, we'll put the links on the web page. So that's helpful stock community to find out more information. And then is it just contact details on the website if, if people want to then get in touch to explore that? Yeah, the, uh, I mean, if you go to helpful, we, we, we'll give you the link to the Back to Health page and you'll be able to um, find that there. Sure. OK, we will do that. Well, thank you so much for your time, Mark. It's been great to have some longer time with you and to chat about a, a fairly broad range in a range of topics. And I've got a load of stuff to think about and we'll, we'll put some notes on the web page. We'll put some links to those resources, certainly to the Back to Health campaign and the other kind of organisations and things that you've mentioned. And if you think of anything else as well, just let me know and we can add that on there. Thank you very much. And for people, if you want to find Mark, you can find him on Twitter at Mark underscore Helpfuls. And Helpfuls.community is the website um, for finding out more about the organisation. So thank you, Mark. Thanks, Alex. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Charity Impact Podcast. And thank you for making it all the way to the end. Just one more thing before you go. If you enjoyed the podcast, please do follow us and leave a rating on Apple, Spotify or whatever platform you're using. It just takes a few seconds and means a lot to me so that I know there are people listening and enjoying the podcast and it's worth investing time in producing more of these episodes. If you'd like to share your feedback, comments or have any questions on this episode in particular, please do post on Twitter, making sure you include me. That's at Alex Blake underscore Keda, K-E-D-A. Or on LinkedIn, it would be at Alex Blake with a space between the first and second name. And that should tag me so I get a notification and I can read and respond to any comments and feedback you have. I'd love to hear from you, um, if nothing else, to reassure me that someone's listening. And any specific feedback will be a huge help with positive spurring me on to do more episodes for you. And the constructive criticism will help me improve. So please don't be shy about sharing your thoughts, advice and tips. Um, it would really, really be appreciated. The Charity Impact Podcast is brought to you by Kida Consulting, the company I started in 2013 to help charities maximise their impact. I work with charities and other non-profits to develop their strategies, explore solutions to the challenges they face, increase and diversify their income, develop partnerships, review performance, undertake research and more. And really the podcast is an extension of that. The consulting work is a one-to-one -one initiative and the podcast enables me to just reach more people and, and share some of the lessons learned from people doing great work in our sector. If you'd like to find out more about us and access all of the episodes on the podcast, um, the website is kedaconsulting.co.uk. You can also there sign up for our emails to ensure you're the first to know about future episodes, articles, live events, and anything else that might be happening. So thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. Until next time, take care.